looks like. Let me just make sure we're here. Hmm. All right, cool, cool. So we are live. Live from Reading at 11.36 p.m. We're going to do one analysis uh, a day for the next 100 days. Now we're into uh, number five. And since today is my birthday, we're going to do something a little bit different. Give me one second. All right, I'm back now. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of my sketches. Now, the reason why they're sketches and not finished work is because a big component of the academy is story and learning how to gesture your ideas out, sketch your ideas out, to think through a profound story. And so I'm going to use uh, one of my sketches to walk you through my thinking process on how I compose uh, an image. So we're going to focus on story and some basic design elements to help communicate those, those ideas. So let's go ahead. Oh, look, it's me. Ha ha ha. So um, I got a new mic today, so I'm really happy. That was my birthday present to myself, but honestly, it was the gift to the community and to the AOC and to anyone who uh, will be coming into the Core 80 and anyone who's listening to this. I wanted uh, to get rid of the echo that was in the other videos and uh, make the sound just elegant, more beautiful, maybe even sexy. So... Uh, I invested in a really nice little mic here. It looks kind of cool. Kind of almost looks like I have a funny tie on. <laughs> um, but enough. Let us get into the artwork because that's why you're here. I will bring up my Photoshop. This is uh, an image that's very, very dear to me. Um, For a couple years, I got onto these uh, these online dating websites, uh, and um, you know, being a single, I can go out and enjoy the fish of the sea, if you will. But in doing that, I was like, eh, I really want uh, someone very significant in my life, and so I decided to compose out what I want. What is it that Don Victor wants when it comes to being in a relationship? Uh, and so I drew it out because something I found in my life is that if I draw it out, it becomes very, very clear what I want. And when I know what I want, I get what I want. And so... Um, it's something I've trained my daughter in to, uh, to do, and she absolutely believes it. If she draws it, she gets it. And, uh, uh, and so there's a process that we go through. Um, with her specifically, she'll draw something out, what she, what she wants, then she'll go research it. So she'll do all of the work to put everything together. And then she needs to acquire the cash to execute on her vision. And that becomes very easy for her to do because she's able to share her vision with other people because they can see it. She draws it out. She researches it. She goes out and finds the numbers and where, where you have to go. I remember this one time, it was Halloween, and she drew out all the little things in her Halloween costume. She went online, found the store, wrote the prices down, and we went to that Halloween shop, and literally we spent maybe four minutes there because she knew exactly where everything was, what it was, the pricing. It was amazing. It was I was so proud of her, and uh, and she created, she drew that thing out, 
and uh, she researched it, planned it, and she made it happen. And when you saw that, you were just like, dude, I want to give her the money to make that dream happen because she did such great work uh, making it so easy for us to, 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 to get it and, and help her. So, um, so that's what I did with this image. So I looked into my own heart. I found, I thought about a lot of things. One of the things I thought about was having somebody in my life that I didn't have to work at uh, trying to please, okay? I wanted to become self-aware of who I am and how I function. And out of my function, out of what my DNA, that part of me that just is natural, I wanted to find someone that would be attracted to those qualities that I do so naturally. So what are those things? And that's what I put into this image and vice versa. You know, I want uh, someone who does things, certain things naturally that I can then, uh, um, that it becomes very easy for me to adore them and uh, admire them for it. So let me share my sketch with you. And all of the little areas, all the little little areas um, and all the meaning in it, okay? So that's what we're gonna focus on today is meaning. And I'm gonna show you how I'm doing it so that when you're actually going and looking at uh, masterwork, you can begin to look for the story, look for the deeper, uh, conversations that's going on with the artist and how the design is ultimately helping that uh, tell that story. So here we are, um, slim down a little bit. <laughs> uh, I like this little collar coming through here. Um, we have a little wine glass. Both of us have wine glasses. We have the two dogs. Um, we're outside on our porch. Okay, uh, there's a scenery in the background, which is absolutely important to this image. Uh, everything in this image is important, uh, from the bookshelves to the wine to what's going on on the door. So let's go ahead and start there. If we look over here at the door, you're going to see three little handprints. Those represent the three children. Sophia, Solomon, and one day, Hannah Victoria. Um, I put in this uh, decanter of wine because I'd like to be with somebody who knows how to socialize, who enjoys good wine and fine things in life and fine quality. Um, you can see that her wine glass is almost empty and mine is still full. <laughs> I'm not a real big drinker. I didn't start drinking until I was about 26 years old. When I was 12 years old, I made a decision that I would not drink until I finished college. And part of that goal was to remain somewhat popular through high school, middle school, middle school, high school, and college. And, and the reason why I made that challenge for myself at such a young age is, was because I wanted to be able to tell my own children that they don't have to drink, they don't have to uh, sub succumb to peer, peer pressure, and they still could remain cool. They still could have, you know, be significant or important in their environment without doing what other people do. And not to say that other people are bad or to judge them. I just wanted to go through that so that when I told my kids that, I had the authority to speak. Because too many parents say, don't do this and don't do that. And then, you know, you find out that they did the, the total opposite. And so that was my challenge that I set for myself when I was 12 years old. And, uh, you know, it was 14 years later uh, when I had my first drink in the... Uh, in Maryland, in Annapolis, Maryland, at a boat show, it was a uh, a Malibu with uh, pina, pineapple juice. Uh, 
very, very delicious. So I, I really don't drink very much. I'll drink on occasion a glass of wine or some alcohol, but I, but I really just don't drink very much uh, because of that. Um, so she'll probably drink a lot more than I do. <laughs> and that's totally fine. I love it. Um, so that that's what the, the wine glasses represent. It represents culture, rep represents socializing, um, for, for many years, I've kind of been re, re, um, kind of to myself. Um, and so, you know, I really had, I, I really didn't live a very social life. I spent a lot of time just kind of understanding, trying to understand composition, understand myself, become self-aware, all these kinds of things. So anyways, that's what that represents. I absolutely love books um, and I love readers. There's something about a woman who reads that I just absolutely find sexy. I, I'm absolutely serious on that. Uh, you know, supermodels with swimsuits are really, really cool. But a woman with a book, to me, that's sexy. <laughs> it's just for her to cultivate her mind, for her to, to take in knowledge and to think about it and process it and to to grow in intelligence, I guess the word is uh, a samof, sam nah, what's the word, there's a word out there, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but basically it means that you're turned on by intelligence, and I'm absolutely turned on by smart people, um, it just, it really does something for me, so uh, much of her sex appeal in my eyes comes from how she's cultivated her mind. And then ultimately, not only cultivated her mind, but also cultivated her heart. And so this is what the books represent um, as well. Uh, on her, so, so you have the bookshelves on the side. Now in the background, you'll see that the house that we have here is built on stone. It's not built with brick. And that's very significant because um, it's really about uh, a commentary on how you build things, how you build people, how you build a life. Uh, and this concept comes from a biblical concept where uh, when the king set out to build the Tower of Babel and he tried to build this huge tower to go into heaven, what he did was he's, he gathered the people around and he taught them how to make bricks. Now, what's what's unique about a brick is that a brick isn't unique. <laughs> okay, every brick is exactly the same. Every, and, and to hold the bricks together, you need some external adhesive. You need something that, that binds them together. Um, and so you need a mortar. You need some type of mortar. And... And to me, I've always seen that more of like uh, a way of controlling people, trying to make people into a cookie cutter, you know, systemizing some type of system that you put people, you process people through so they come out exactly the same on the other end. And then you need something, maybe a government or uh, taxes or uh, something to force the people into a mind, into conforming into this thing. And that would be your mortar. So fast forward a couple thousand years, you have Solomon building the temple. And in the instructions on building the temple, they were not allowed to use brick. Okay, they had to build it from stone. And what was unique about the stone was that each piece of stone had to be perfectly chiseled so that it locked in and fit with the stones that were around it. And so each stone was unique. It had its unique own configuration, but the stones that were around it had their own unique configuration, but they also had to lock in and fit within the stones that were adjacent to them. So what this tells me is that the way we build something that's natural, that if you are a spiritual person that honors God, is to build it in such a way that the pieces interlock together like a puzzle. 
And so at the academy, this is my focus. It's not to create a system where everybody goes in one end and comes out, you know, equal, uh, you know, just like a cookie cutter brick on the other end. We want to design a system and a f format, and we've achieved that through our meetups and our training where people come in and we teach them principles. We teach them principles. And the environment is, 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 is designed in such a way that everyone comes in and they get to develop themselves as a very, uh, they, they get to come in and develop their authority and their power uh, in that setting. And so this is how we build our house, which is with living stone, the stone. What's interesting is that um, when Solomon built the temple, uh, another instruction was that the stones had to be chiseled off site. So the place in which the um, in which the uh, stones were actually brought together and, and for the temple, they were to be assembled there, but not chiseled there. There was not you were not allowed to hear a hammer and a chisel on the site, and that's again very very profound. So right now the core eighty that we're looking for have already been chiseled. Okay, they're coming. Uh, and if you're part of that, if this resonates with you, you know for years you've been looking for this kind of information on, on composition, on design, taking your art to another level. You've known about this kind of information. You just didn't know exactly where to, to come and lock in. And so that's what the core 80 is. It's, it's those, those living stones coming together from around the world, locking in together and doing, making a huge mark a huge wave in the art community. Um, and so that's how we build. We don't build with brick, we build with stone. Each stone is a unique individual and they relate to the ones around them. So that's why uh, the back of that house is constructed out of stone and not brick. Now, um, we are sitting on chairs, right? And if you notice that the chair, it has this curve and it flows into each other like this. Okay. Now what this represents is as your eye moves through this image like this, we're one, we're connected. Our energies are flowing together. But what's beautiful is you can see that there is a lot of space between us. But if you look down here, our legs are touching. So in the root, in our root, we're one, we're touching. But as we come up, we allow in our relationship to uh, have space so that I can be me, she can be her, and in this space, we're still together, we're still one, our, 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 our roots are one, but we're individuals, okay? And so we don't, uh, we don't want to smother each other, right? There's no controlling of the other person. There's a lack of, uh, there's, there's fearlessness in this relationship. So therefore, we don't need to always be on top of each other, you know, unless, <laughs> no. Um, so we don't need to be on top of each other, smothering each other, controlling each other, you know, and basically bringing all those insecurities into the relationship. So, uh, so that's what this, this is why we're, we're facing each other now. One reason, another reason why we're facing each other is because of love language. Now, if you haven't heard of the concept of a love language, I would in, encourage you to go out and read the book or just go on and YouTube or, or the internet and find the basics of, of the love language. Um, I can tell you basically in a nutshell what it is. Um, there are five languages to love, how we receive and how we give love. And oftentimes a relationship will fail because of a lack of communication. And, and, and it's basically like a Chinese guy saying to an, an Italian, hey, I love you. And the Italian is saying to the Chinese, I love you. But because they're speaking different languages, they have no idea what they're saying. And so for some people, like myself, 
if you want to love me, you need to give me your time. I don't give a crap if you buy me gifts. I, I really don't care. Some people try to, you know, bestow gifts on me and they get hurt because I don't really receive gifts very well. It's not my love language. Um, I don't, I, you know, I spend, uh, you know, time with me and then I receive love. So that's how I receive love. Uh, my daughter, uh, she she's a gift giver. She loves creating and giving gifts to people. That's how she gives love. Uh, my son, he loves touch, you know. So I know to um, uh, to express love to him, I need to wrestle with him. I need to get aggressive with him. I need to hold his hand. I need to rub his head, you know, bring him close to me. He needs to feel the touch. And that's his love language. So in this case, my love language is spending time with me. And so the woman in this image is being extremely generous with her time, her attention, her energy is focused on me, right? Um, or at least it's pointed in my direction because she's giving me her undivided attention. Even though she's reading, we don't need to sit there be talking necessarily, um, which is another love language. We're just in each other's presence, and that's, for me, love. That's how I receive it. So I'm very, very aware of that. Now, um, I also love talking. I love talking. Um, I love flowery talk. I love poetic and romantic talk. I'm a poet in my heart. Um, at heart, I mean. And so if you notice back here, there are these flower it's a flower bed okay and if you notice that the flower bed comes from my mouth and it goes to her ear okay so since I naturally love talking and love encouraging people and love uh, speaking beautiful things into people's lives I would think Okay, at least in this image, that the love language of my partner would be words. There, are, my my brother, his love language is words. You know, uh, when we were younger, I never understood love languages when I was younger, but I just thought it was weird how he would always do this thing. Uh, when my parents would say, "Hey, go and do a chore," he'd go do it, and then it, uh, he would almost get a little upset, like if. Uh, like if nobody said anything to him, he had to get like that verbal confirmation. And I always thought it was a little weird um, until I got older and I realized, oh, that's that's that was him receiving love. Right. So he, he needed to hear uh, verbal confirmation, you know, verbal encouragement. He did a great job, you know, and then he would receive that love. So, um, in this image, the person that I see myself with will have a natural tendency to receive love through words, words of affection, okay? And that's why I designed this flower bed in the background, because those are my words going to from my mouth to her ears. Now, if we look above the flower bed, okay, we're going to see a table. This is a table. This is called the long table. And the long table is uh, an element that's, that continues to repeat itself in a lot of my dreams. And the long table represents family. It represents uh, community. It represents uh, what I call the core 80, okay? Um, in many dreams I've had, th this long table is just filled with composers artists and so the reason why it's where it is in this image is because oops it's where my eyes are and my mind are so this is the vision this is where my this is what my mind is focused on and my vision okay now it goes to her head because she's sharing in that vision she's sh she's sharing in those thoughts um and one side of it's her chair, the other is mine, 
and there's nobody else really in that image. I mean, there's no other chairs or benches at this time. People aren't sitting there, but it's just basically because we're in the beginning processes of building this. So at least when I sketched this out, that's where I was. Now, I might end up putting chairs there because we are now growing and we're having people actually sit at that table. So this is the long table and you'll, if you read my book, The, um, the uh, Pencil Prophet, I talk about the long table a lot, okay? Now I'm doing my thing, which is I'm drawing, I'm sketching my beautiful partner, my wonderful uh, little lady here. And while well, she's reading and she's looking down with such um, kindness onto our two dogs. Now, why the two dogs? Well, I know that one of the dogs is designing composition. Now, why would I say that? Because uh, I had a dream years ago where uh, I had a black dog and, and basically I died in my studio as an old man and the black dog was stuck in the studio. And when sharing this with one of the um, one of my dear friends, Costanza, she basically said that the black dog represented composition and design, and that if I didn't get this information out to people, out to the artists, then I would die with that information in me, trapped in me, trapped in my studio, uh, and it would be gone. And when she said that, it just I just knew that that's what my purpose in life was, was to come and bring composition, to bring aesthetic design training to artists, and not only to artists, but also art lovers, so that they could begin to read and, and, and decode and really get deeper into the artwork. And so that's what the black dog represents here. Now, when I first sketched this out, I was like, well, why do I have two dogs in there? I didn't, I didn't get that at first. I said, okay, well, maybe one of them is... Um, well, I know one of them is Norman. It, it is the, the dog of composition. But what is the other dog? And then it dawned on me. Wait, that's not my dog. That's her dog. So she has a vision in her life. And together, the space in which we create, which is really the relationship, in the relationship that we're, that we're together, in that space... Both of our purposes, both of our dreams, both of our visions, both of our missions are fulfilled. They're cared for, just like these little puppies. They're cared for, okay, in the space that we exist, in the, the, the space that we create, okay? Um, and so that's what that means. So I always envision a black dog kind of like a black lab. Now, when we're composing, we really do want to look for high points of contrast and light against a very dark. So ultimately, I think what I'll end up doing is making her dog a yellow lab, my dog a black lab. And therefore, out of all of this information that's going on in this image, the two most important uh, pieces, the highest point of contrast, the highest point of focus is the fulfillment of our purpose in life. My case being design, composition, and teaching that and getting that out to the artist and hers being what it is for her, right? And so that's what those two dogs represent there. Now, let's look at the background here. We see two cypress trees here. We see a row of trees here. In this case, they're lemon trees, and then we see a vineyard coming back here. Now, this is all extremely important uh, because for me, the the cypress trees represent uh, um, culture. Okay, the lemon trees represent inheritance or wealth, and then the uh, vineyards represent tradition. Okay, now, tradition, wealth, and then culture of what? In my case, uh, I look at that as passing on the tradition, the inheritance, and, and, um, and the culture of high composition, of high design, 
uh, because composition and storytelling have been the bed mark of art for five, six, seven, maybe 10,000 years, okay? It, it's what makes, it's the two things that have, uh, the two threads that have followed through art from the beginning, outside of uh, mediums, outside of uh, periods and movements, outside of uh, subjects and, 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 like I said, mediums, designing and storytelling have been there from the beginning, and they'll always be there because that's what art is about. It's about sharing an idea, uh, sharing a feeling, communicating a story, and doing it in such a way um, that you're that that it becomes effective communication. And the way it becomes effective is by uh, designing it, laying it out, um, engineering it, architecting it, composing it, uh, ordering it, and so that's what <clears throat> uh, those three uh, areas of vegetation mean. Um, now you can see here in another image. This is actually a long table uh, drawing. Uh, originally, the drawing ended here. Hold on, ended there. It didn't feel right, so I extended th this uh, this piece to it. Um, but I think I'm going to ultimately extend this image almost uh, almost two, three, maybe even four times the distance. Uh, I've been entertaining the thought lately that I'm actually going to put the core 80 there and put 80, like paint this out, draw it out with 80 composers sitting at that table, putting food on the table, um, uh, the, the Vargas grids on the table, having lines, you know, showing potentially maybe the whole process of our composition process along that table. Okay. Now, if we look at this image, you'll see our black dog is present, which is composition, okay? Uh, you'll see a lemon tree here, which comes down on this side of Hannah, okay? Hannah would be the youngest daughter, and so she would get the inheritance uh, from her mother and I. Uh, and Solomon, he would be in charge of the culture, because the culture is basically, Solomon's in charge of, um, uh, in my mind, he's in charge of working with the people. And that's the impartation of the culture. And, um, and then Sophia, she deals with tradition, the traditions. And the traditions are really the beliefs and the ideas and the thinking that we go through, and since Sophia's name means Sophia means uh, wisdom, she, she, I've always said to Sophia, she's my mind, Solomon's my body, and Hannah is my heart, and so she deals with the uh, the mind part of of this process, which is the traditions. Now, in this image, oops, that wasn't cool. Let's try that again. In this image, you'll see. Here that the cypress trees are above Solomon, that the lemon trees are above Hannah. And then back here, I'm composing out the rows of vineyards, which are behind or and above Sophia, like an older version of Sophia. Okay, and then we come out through here which then brings us the ocean. And that's really where, once we get from here on, that's where we're gonna really put our core 80 because they're the ocean, okay? They, they, these are like the founding, the founding members of the academy. And so we go from them to the core 80 to the center 300 in 2018. And then in 2019, we go um, to building the academy up to 2,500 people, uh, maybe even beyond that. But that's the goal for the next couple of years. And 
so in this drawing, you can see how I'm thinking, how I'm telling a story, how I'm using design to strategically place things in this story. And it's all intentional. It's all, you know, you're spending a lot of time with yourself and, and knowing your own EQ, your emotional intelligence, and then using your, your brain, uh, your, your IQ to uh, figure